Let's discuss the opening part of section 3.5, found on pages 194 through 197 of your textbook, as well as the key ideas on pages 198, 199, and the summary on page 199. There are two primary vocabulary terms to get out of the beginning of section 3.5. The first is a random error, which is defined as the error or variability which arises from choosing your sample. The term error here is a misnomer. In science, error has historically been used to represent variability, not wrongdoing. Random errors show up in random samples because each sample will be different. We can quantify random error and we will do that in later sections. Random errors are deliberate and due to the randomness in selecting a sample. These are not mistakes. Non-random errors are mistakes. They result from biased sampling methods or from poor question wording. There is no statistical fix for a non-random error. Once they occur during data collection, there will be significant limitations placed on any results which come from the data. Random samples in which questions are phrased correctly will not have non-random errors. This video will focus on non-random errors, bias sampling methods, and what is known as response bias. It will go into more detail than the textbook, so be sure to take notes from this video. Results based on a survey are considered biased if the methods used to obtain those results would consistently produce values that are either too low or too high. In other words, the statistics from these samples will consistently be above or below the parameter we are trying to estimate. The first type of bias we'll talk about is selection bias. Selection bias occurs if the method for selecting participants produces a sample that does not represent the population of interest. An example of selection bias are online polls. Online polls are actually a, an example of voluntary response bias, which is one type of selection bias. Voluntary response bias occurs when we have data from everyone who volunteered to respond, like you see in online polls. When this happens, the people who volunteer their responses are usually not representative of the entire population of interest, and therefore the sampling method is biased and our statistics will not be good estimators of the parameter. Another example of selection bias is when we use the wrong sampling frame. Remember from section 2.1 that the sampling frame is the list of observational units from which the sample is selected. Ideally, the sampling frame would include all observational units in the population. However, if this is not the case and we have the wrong sampling frame, then we will miss sampling some portion of the population, which leads to what we call under coverage. A good example of a wrong sampling frame are telephone surveys. Most often, telephone surveys are targeting all adults, but there are many adults with no landline or an unlisted phone number. Those people would never be sampled and therefore we are missing them in our sample and our sample will no longer be representative of all adults. Instead of using a phone directory, random digit dialing would allow us to sample those who are unlisted or those who only have cell phones. A second type of bias you should know about is called non-participation or more often non-response bias. Non-response bias occurs when we obtain a representative sample, but a subset of our sample cannot be contacted or chooses not to respond. For example, if a news organization is trying to reach out to viewers, it might be impossible to reach an entire random sample in one night. People may not be home when they're contacted, and therefore their results are not included in the polls results which are reported on the news that night. These type of quickie polls are an example of non-response bias. A key feature of non-response bias is that uh, someone is selected to be in the sample, but chooses not to respond or cannot be contacted. Volunteer samples, where we have not selected the sample, we're just gathering information from people who volunteer, therefore fall under the category of selection bias, 
instead of non-response bias. A third type of bias to be aware of is called response bias. Response bias occurs when participants respond, but they provide incorrect information, intentionally or not. The incorrect information may have come from question wording, who is asking the question, or even misremembering an event. Here is an example of how question wording could impact responses. If you are interested in the percentage of people who think abortion should be legal, you could phrase the question, do you agree that abortion, the murder of innocent beings, should be outlawed? In which case, we would probably find a low percentage of people who think abortion should be legal. On the other hand, if you phrase the question, do you agree that there are circumstances under which abortion should be legal to protect the rights of the mother, your percentage who think abortion should be legal will probably be higher. Here's another example to show how question wording can have a big impact on your results. In a 2003 survey of teens and drug use, teens were given two different versions of the same question. Half teens were asked, which is easiest for someone your age to buy, cigarettes, beer, or marijuana? While the other half was asked, which is easiest for someone your age to obtain, cigarettes, beer, or marijuana? These seem like very similar questions. However, we see very different results based on the two versions, especially comparing beer to marijuana. 34% of teens said marijuana was the easiest to buy, but only 19% said it was the easiest to obtain. Conversely, 18% of teens said beer was the easiest to buy, while 27% said it was the easiest to obtain. Response bias could also come up if you ask someone about an issue that they aren't aware of. People don't like to admit that they don't know what you're talking about. If you Google Jimmy Kimmel Light Witness News, you can see this in action in some very comical situations. In summary, although these terms are not in your textbook, we do expect you to be familiar and answer questions about the three types of bias discussed in this video selection bias, non-response bias, and response bias. Remember, selection bias comes in the method in how the sample was selected. Non-response bias occurs when we've already selected a sample, but people choose not to participate or can't be reached. Response bias occurs once I have already collected my sample and people have agreed to participate but their answers to questions don't reflect the truth. How might these biases occur? Selection bias occurs from using the wrong sampling frame or volunteer samples. Convenience sampling or sampling those who are convenient to you is another way selection bias might occur. Non-response bias occurs when you're not able to reach individuals selected for a sample or you are able to contact them, but they choose not to participate. And response bias occurs from deliberate or unintentional bias in question wording, the desire of respondents to please or to seem informed, or confidentiality and anonymity concerns. In summary, when reading the results of a poll, think about the types of bias that might have occurred. Ask yourself, who was asked? And how were they chosen? Who responded? Was there non-response bias? Exactly what was asked? How was it phrased? And who did the asking? How were these people contacted? And finally, what was the margin of error of the poll? Or what was the quantified random error that occurred in your study?